So hello, uh, I'm starting to record. Um, I this is the talk that about for um, Hack and Craft about the scheme, uh, basically a scheme tutorial, intro to scheme, uh, kind of wide ranging. Um, it doesn't require previous Lisper scheme knowledge. And uh, the goal is to get you started with understanding how Scheme works. And by the end of it, if we manage to make it all the way through, we'll manage to get to the how to implement Scheme in Scheme, even if it's just a very fast version of that. Um, so um, there, what you see on my screen here is the, the Scheme Primer. I put in the chat a link to the Scheme Primer. Uh, so that's the document that basically is the text version of this talk. So if you want to follow along, you can kind of just like read that as we go through. Um, but I'm going to jump uh, back over now and uh, start. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start reading through thing. Uh, um, I'm going to read through privately and I'm going to pull up a REPL here. So here's my little scheme REPL where I can uh, read a valid print loop. It's a place where I can do uh, write test code. You don't have to just write in this. So um, for example, here's another file where I've got some code. I can put stuff in here and the way schemers often do things. I can evaluate stuff here like plus one, two, three. And if I do the magic stuff to evaluate it, you see down here that it says six. Um, and I can use the thing that I evaluated up there to do um, things over here. So um, that wasn't very clear, but I just want to give you an idea that scheme programmers are usually jumping back and forth between a context of doing experimental programming at the interactive REPL and then doing programming uh, that is like going uh, piece by piece through the um, uh, that they're kind of saving in, in some sort of long lived file. But anyway, let's jump into the actual programming language by actually doing some things. Right, so um, the the first thing you usually want to do in a programming language is to show off by say doing hello world, right? So display hello world, and this little thing right here gives us a new line, and it prints out to the screen hello world. Um, so that's the, that's what display does. It prints to the screen, and we could actually just do hello world, new line or not. We can even skip it. And, and it just returns it as a value. Um, so you can see there's a difference between printing things and returning things. So returning things is where we get a value back. Um, and in fact, there's wonderful things you can do when you get values back, um, such as, yeah. So we can define, you know, saying as hello world, and um, we can bring that back, right? Just by typing the word saying again, it brings back those words. Um, so we'll, we'll do some more stuff with that in a moment, but what's also interesting is that we can, um, we have these neat things that are called procedures. So if we can do like plus one, two, and it gives us a number three, we can do divided by 10, two, and it gives us a number five. We can do divided by two and three. So the, this forward slash means division, and it gives us two thirds. Now there's a few things that you notice about this. The display hello world, if you've done programming before, Maybe this seems a little bit weird because the parentheses, it might not be where you expect it. In most programming languages, the parentheses would be like this, right? Well, we just move it one to the left in Scheme. So not, not so scary and in Lisps in general. Um, but it's it gets a little bit weirder here. You might be like, well, but I, I thought we do one plus two, right? Well, that's not how we're doing it here. We're putting the plus over here, plus one, two. And that's because, you know, you could think, well, what if we, we could just have a function named um, uh, add, which is the same as plus, add one, two, and it seems less weird in other programming languages because, you know, you might think add one, two, and that doesn't seem so surprising, right? Um, anyway, the, uh, the interesting thing about list though, and having all these parentheses is that, um, it actually gives you a lot of interesting power to understand what's, uh, going on in the language. So for example, yeah, sure, we can multiply two and 21, but, you know, what we also could do is multiply um, the subtraction of 8 and the division of 30 and 5, right? So, um, and we'll multiply that times 21. And what do we get? We get 42, right? Well, how do we get there? How do we get to that number, right? Well, we can simplify, simplify, simplify. So, what we could do 
You know, what? what's this piece? Well, that's six. So that means that we could take this, rewrite that with six, right? Well, so that's going to give us 42 again. And what's this piece, right? That's two, right? So therefore, we know that that times eight and six, uh, sorry, the times minus eight, six is, um, it is going to be, um, this part is two. And two times 21 is 42. So this is called, um, this is called simple, like, uh, the substitution method. Uh, when you look at this in the paper, you'll see it printed here. You know, you get this beginning expression and then simplify, simplify, simplify. And it's really pretty. You know, you can do that kind of stuff with a lot of programming languages and kind of understand how they're working that way, right? So um, now let's, uh, but there, the, we, there are other types of numbers, right? So we saw um, we, 42 is a number, right? But so is 98.6, right? Um, but earlier we did divided by two and three in a lot of other programming languages. Well, what, what you know, you probably would have expected something like this, 0 0.6666, right? But in Scheme, what you get is two-thirds, right? And that's because by default, we have an exact representation. So we get the 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 rational number, right? The the uh, um, the version of it that's, you know, like a fraction, basically. Um, and that allows us to be really good for, like, scientific programs and stuff like that. And so what we can do is uh, we, we can have these. So this one here is lossy, right? Like, it's not as precise. So this is considered inexact. Um we can also make these things negative, right? So we can put that in there two thirds, but we can also do negative two thirds, right? Okay, all right, that's that's pretty cool, but um, it's you know the world isn't just numbers, right? There are also things that are true, and we call those hashtag t in scheme, and there are things that are false; those are hashtag false, um, uh, t hashtag f. Um, so we there are also words that we might say. So earlier we said you know hello world. That's that's text, right? But the way we call that here, we call it a string. Um, so uh, we can also do, um, there's also a weird thing that kind of looks like a string, but it actually isn't. So what's this? It looks like a string, but it's not actually a string. That's kind of funny. Um, it's called a symbol. So this is this seems a little bit weird. Most programming languages, they have these other things I've shown, but they don't have this symbol thing. Um, well, turns out there's, there's a reason for this. And, you know, uh, so I can do this, right? Plus one, two, right? So that's a, um, that's cool. Uh, let's, let me show you one more data structure before we get to why we have this quote thing, right? So another thing that we can do is we could do, you know, list one, two, right? Well, earlier we did quote foo. We can also use this quote thing to make a list in a certain way. We do quote one, two. Oh, and it makes a list. Okay, so it makes the same list that we did earlier. That's fine. Um, but but here's something a little bit weird. What if we do the plus one, two, but we put the quote before this? What do you think is going to happen? That uh, plus, it doesn't run, right? It actually turns into data. And so sometimes you hear Lispers talk about code that can write code and how Lisp is really powerful for that. And that's actually exactly what we're doing here. Um, this is code that can write code. Um, so, um, and you can, so we later on, so there are other types of things that we're going to get to, like, for example, procedures. So, um, the name of a procedure with no name is Lambda. Uh, that's the thing that gets you procedures with no names. Um, so if we wanted to make a procedure that would double things, make them times two, we could do this, right? So it says, oh, you've got this procedure. Well, earlier we, we found out that we can name things with define. So we can do define double. Well, I guess we could name this. Right? Now we have a double procedure. Double two, and we get four. Double 22, and we get 44, right? Okay. And via the substitution method, we can kind of understand what's happening here. Oh, okay. It's it's this lambda is actually helps us with the substitution because the 22 goes in here. You know, it's like saying, oh, X is 22 now, which means that we know how to return this with 22. We can strip out this outer lambda, and then, you know, it times 22 and 2, and, and we know that's 44, right? So in 20, double 22, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but here's something that's kind of funny. Earlier we did define double blah, 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 right? Watch this. I'm going to put this quote in front of it. What do you think happens? We got that as data. We got a piece of program as data, right? Um, so this is actually a list of the symbol lambda, right? Lambda there. 
and all these other things. So we're going to get to this more a little bit later. I'm just giving you kind of a sneak peek of the idea that code and data are not as far apart as you might think in some other programming languages. Okay. Well, let's get another tool to be able to do interesting things. So we showed we could name things earlier. So how about let's give a name to our friend Jane. Okay. Hi, Jane. Um, well, actually, we want to say hi, Jane. Let's make a new string. Uh, remembering that string is... Uh, String is the name for text, right? String append, hello, name, exclamation mark. Um, so what's happening right here, right? String append, well, it makes sense enough that we can say yay and exclamation mark, and it, it puts those two strings together, right? And gives us yay with an exclamation mark. Well, this is just a substitution method all over again. Since name, remember, name was Jane, right? Name is Jane, so we could put Jane in here. String append. Oh, okay, well, this makes sense. We can understand this, right? Well, maybe we want to greet a lot of people, right? Um, so I want to say, okay, you know, this is a pretty good template right here, but I want to change what name is. I could do this. We saw how to do this earlier. Yeah, this lambda thing, right? So let's, let's do greet. Let's call this thing greet. We have this lambda thing. Let's put name. So greet is now a procedure, takes the argument name, greet Jane. But I saw that uh, Arnie just joined us, so um, although they just kind of disappeared from audio, so they're not going to see me showing this off, but uh, greet Arnie, and I'll say hello Arnie, right? Um, so uh, the so that that's cool enough, right? Um, but uh, maybe uh, maybe we want to um, maybe maybe this doesn't look so pretty, right? Greet lambda. This lambda is getting in the way. It's hard for us to read it. Wouldn't it look much nicer if we had something like this? Let's get rid of this lambda. But we can do that. So, but this is just syntax sugar. That's what it's called. Syntax sugar is ways of making things look prettier, more convenient. These two things are the same thing. Define, and then you've got the greet, and then like you just put the parentheses around it. So see the difference here. This one does not have parentheses around the thing we're naming. This one does. So this one, when you've got this, it just says, oh, I know you're making a procedure. You know what? I'll help make that a little bit prettier. Okay, so that's what um, that's what that format does. Um, okay, that's fine. That's good. That sounds great. Um, but, you know, what else can we do? Um, well, we did the greet and um, let me choose a different name. Let's do um, Morgan, you know, my, my co-host here, right? Well, maybe I want to greet Morgan, but um, gee, if we could just substitute greet, if we could substitute things by their name, and if greet is this, does that mean I could just put this procedure here instead of greet? I mean, this is the same as greet, right? What do you think is going to happen? Oh, it works. Hi, Morgan, right? So that works. So you can, the substitution method, so here's the real idea is that the first thing that's happening here is a procedure, right? Greet. Um, and uh, procedures are one type of thing called expression in Scheme. Um, there are other types of uh, parenthetical expressions. So this is the point at which some people start to get scared because they start to see a lot of parentheses. But one of the things that you can notice is that my editor is helping me out a lot. So if you have a good editor, it helps you figure out where things go. Helps you move around, um, and it helps you, you know, helps you complete things, right? Um, you know, it, and, it, and it tells me, oh, okay, you know, here's here's what these arguments take. Um, in fact, it, it even remembers what the thing I just defined with greet. Oh, the next thing is a name, you know? The next name on the list, I guess, is, uh, we'll do f.rift, right? Hello, f.rift, right? Um, okay, great. Um, well... Maybe I just want to name things just for a little bit, just for a short little period of time. Um, to answer Morgan's question, yes, I did intentionally use 42 as a number. Uh, so maybe I want to just name it just in the middle of something. So name Horus. Remember, we already have a name for the outer scope, right? Name Horus. But inside of this, I want it to mean something else. String append. Greetings. Name Right? Greetings, Horus. Right? 
So in this is called let expression. And inside, of, here's where we're doing our bindings. Um, we're saying that name is going to be Horace, but only for the stuff inside of this let. Okay, we can do all sorts of things with let expressions. And honestly, schemers have way too many different variants of uh, let expressions. There's also let star. So you could do name. Um, uh, let's do another one for the list. How about Steven? Right? And then I can do um, greeting. Yes. Um, string append. Um, uh, salutations. Um, so this this one is a name, and then this greeting actually knows how to use the previous thing with the name. You need to use the let star to be able to do that. But then we can remember what we display is how we could print things out to the screen. Well, I'm gonna put a new line here because otherwise this is gonna look ugly. But I can do display greeting. Anything's gonna happen. Well, it says salutation Stephen to the screen. So does that mean that name is now Stephen? Remember we had a name here at the top level. Nope, it's still Jane. And that's because, you know, this name is only within this let, this let star, right? Well, do you remember earlier? So when I did this, though, the name Horace, um, and and we also had this other version of, I want to pull up the define greet, right? The not, the name, right? So if I, if I do let name Horace, right? And then I do string append, than that, right? Well, this actually looks very similar to earlier when we did, we just grab this lambda, put it here, and then we put chorus, right? That's because it is the same. Um, because let is actually just sugar for make a lambda, and then pass this in as an argument immediately. That's how let works under the hood, right? Um, now, maybe we, I said we have, we can have lists of things. Um, so we have one, two, three, right? That's a list of numbers. I can do, um, and we have this way to add them together with plus, right? So I can do plus one, two, three, but maybe I've got num list, you know, one, two, three. I can do apply um, plus num list. And that thing's smart. It says, okay, I'm going to take this plus and what's in the num list? Right, this wouldn't work, right? Because it's gonna try to add a list, right? But but the num list is one, two, three, so it just says okay, one, two, three, and it unpacks them, right? Um, so that's what apply does. Uh, you could do the same, and you can do something kind of interesting. Um, it there's a pun on the dot that we'll see later. Define chatty add chatty name numbers. And we'll say format true. So format. I'm going to throw in something called format. So format is a little helpful string substitution thing. So if we do uh, this tilde A, if you uh, so say, you know, cool um, idea. Okay. All right. So maybe we have Alice and Bob. And this will say, cool idea, Bob. Right. Um, so uh, there's with false, it'll return it. And with true, it'll print it. Um, okay, so uh, that means I can make define chatty add, chatty name, some numbers, and then do format true a, if you add those together, you get a, and then we'll do put in our chatty name. And let's do our apply plus and numbers. And chatty add, um, let's call it Susan. And then we'll just do th three, four, five, six. And it's gonna take these as, and put that as the list numbers. So if you add those together, you get 18. All right, uh, if, you're, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by this, it's okay. You don't have to stress about the details. You can read the paper, try to get a feel for what's happening here, right? Um, there's also an idea of something called uh, multiple value return. Uh, not as important. I'm going to actually, I think I'm going to skip over that one for this. Uh, let's focus on, uh, let's talk about how to do things and not do things, right? So we earlier I said true and there's false, right? 
Well, how do we, how can we find out whether or not something's true? Well, we had these strings earlier, right? So this was not a string. This is a number 42. What is a string, right? Could something tell us if something's a string? Sure. String question mark. Apple. That's a, that's a string. Well, how's this pronounced? That question mark, weird, actual true stuff is pronounced, huh? So this is called string, huh? Right? Weird lisp history, right? So um, apple's a string. But what about 42? Not a string. False. It is not a string. Okay. So, well, what can we do with that, right? So maybe we want to have, uh, so, so here's an if, right? An if can do something or not do something. So if this is true, we say, you know, that's pretty true. You know, in other words, else, that seems false, right? So that's pretty true. If we do F, that seems false. And actually, here's something funny about Scheme. You can put any number in here, or anything, literally anything. We can put banana here. And that's considered true. Anything that's not false is true in Scheme. Pretty weird, huh? Uh, but there, there's a good reason for that. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but, you know, so maybe, what can we do with this? Well, we could say maybe there's somebody who really likes strings. String enthusiast. And if they say, um, if it's a string object, they say string append, you know, oh my gosh, it's the string. And then we'll put the object here. And then some exclamation marks, right? And otherwise, also it just says, hey, give me a string next time, right? String enthusiast 88. Hey, give me a string next time. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. How about banana? Oh my gosh, it. Well, bump my, bump my microphone with uh, excitement there. Oh my gosh, it's a string banana, right? Okay, cool. So we have if. That's exciting, right? Yeah, it's kind of exciting. Um, so you can also do comparisons. So we can do, you know, well, eight, is eight greater than nine, huh? Well, the alligator mouth is wants to go to the one that's bigger, and this one's not bigger, so it's going to say no. Eight is not bigger than nine. Oh, except that this is all prefix notation. So it goes there. All right, okay, so that's not bigger than nine. That is. All right. Prefix notation is kind of letting us down in this example, but we'll we'll ignore that for now. But uh, maybe we have uh, now that we can compare things. Who likes to compare things? Right? So who has preferences? Well, Goldilocks does. Right, Goldilocks. We can give her some number n, and you know, she's got the smallest thing that's okay and the biggest thing that's okay. Right, and you know, if it's smaller. If n is smaller than the smallest, okay, then she's going to say, uh, too small. But, um, hmm, does that mean this is just right? Nope, that's not correct, right? Because there's actually three cases. Right, so, you know, if it's bigger n and biggest, okay, then uh, the it is too big. Otherwise, else it's just right. All right. Now, does Goldilocks work? Goldilocks, let's give it um, 3, 10, and 20. 3 is too small. 33 is too big. But 13 is just right. Right? It's in the range. Um, cool. So Goldilocks uh, allows, uh, uh, has strong preferences. Good for you, Goldilocks. Right? Um, but this is ugly. This isn't how we want to write code. It's not how I want to write code. Can we do better? We can. We can do better. Um, so this if, putting an if in an if, it's hard to, hard to think that way, right? Well, there's a, there's a thing, there's an alternate option. Okay. Let's take this Goldilocks and we're going to use something else called cond. Cond is hip. Cond has a thing to test and then the answer. So if this thing, and then we don't have to do another if, we can just say, oh, okay, too big. And then finally, else, just right. Ooh, okay, this is easier to read. All the previous cases should work. Let's find out. Too small, 
too big. And just right. Okay, good. That's great. Uh, so um, this is much more readable because it doesn't have the confusing nested ifs, so you can have multiple multiple cases. All right, if you've done other programming languages, you're like Snore. I've seen all this type of stuff before, right? We're going to get to the cool stuff in a minute. Um, uh, but, uh, let's, let's, let's keep going. Uh, uh, Rose, I believe Morgan's doing okay. Morgan can correct if Morgan is not doing okay. It's just that, uh, I'm giving the presentation on, uh, scheme stuff. Uh, so, um, uh, so this is a special hack and craft, which, uh, can be filled in in the chat. Uh, um, so, okay. So a list, list, one, two, three. Oh, you're probably asking because Morgan was sick in the previous episode. Uh, in the previous episode, I mentioned it. Morgan can fill in on that in the chat. So, all right. So we've got a list here, right? And we've got b list. These look like they're the same. Are they the same? Equal a list and b list. Yeah, they're the same, right? Uh, but what about a list and a list? Okay, of course those are the same, right? Okay, what about eek a list and a list? Well, wait, this is a weird version of equal, huh? Only two letters. Okay, well a list is the same as a list. But is a list eek to b list? It is not eek, right? So uh, eq or eek um, is uh, um, the identity comparison. It's actually asking whether or not they're actually literally the same object in memory. So these two things are equivalent, uh, you know, they're equal. They have the same content, but they are not eek. They do not have the same identity. They are two different objects in memory. So eek and equal are two different things. Uh, so the, the most understated uh, um, statement in computer science appears in uh, Propagator's paper by Sussman and Alexei Radul, and it says equality is a tough subject. The deeper you go in computer science, you realize how, how true that is. There are all sorts of tricky things with that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to skip forward a bit. If you're reading this tutorial to, uh, um, if you're following along as we go, uh, cause I want to get to the list stuff, right? So Lisp, what does Lisp stand for? Stands for list processing. Uh, um, and also welcome Rose. Actually, I appreciate that you are asking about whether or not Morgan is well, uh, it's nice to hear that the listeners of our show, uh, care about such things. Uh, anyway. Uh, so let me, uh, do list one, two, cat 38, 33.8 and the symbol foo, right? So one thing we learned earlier is that if we put this quote here, we don't need this other quote, right? It automatically happens. What do you think happens if I actually put the quote here? We quote, oh, the word quote shows up. Why is that? Quote foo. Oh, it's the same thing. Okay. That's kind of funny. Right, so what about quote one, two, three? Gives us a list one, two, three. That's kind of interesting. So this is we've run into sugar again. This is sugar for this. Same thing. Okay. All right. Cute. Who cares though, right? Well, we're gonna care in a moment. All right. So um what's this? Well, that's the empty. It's a list that's empty, right? In fact, it's the empty list. Uh, but, you know, maybe we, we want to make a list, but we don't want to use that list thing. This feels like cheating. List, one, two, three. Mm, no, we want to build this up piece by piece. How do we do it? Well, we could start with three, but actually what we really needed to start with is nothing, right? Nothing in the list. Now, here's this thing that builds lists. Cons. So we're good. If we start with three, now we have a list with the number three in it. Okay. Cons two. Now we have a list with two and three in it. And if we need cons one, we have one, two, three. Ah, okay. So this is kind of interesting. One, two, three. In fact, is this equal? Sure is. They're the same thing. Uh, um, Yes, uh, Fionix Rift made this comment in the chat. Mathematicians, 200 different words uh, for nuanced versions of the same. Yes. Uh, um, so anyway, this cons is a list constructor, sort of. Um, you can also do something funny. Cons A and B. Right. So if we const A onto the empty list, we get a list A. So what happens if I just cons A onto B? A dot B. 
I thought that scheme only had prefix syntax. Oh, dot, dot is infix. So this is actually means cons in that there's a, uh, this is, a, that's because actually these are called linked lists. So the, 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 the whole list actually stands for the phrase list processing. And that's because Lispers love Lisp. They, uh, we make all our crap out of all these lists piece by piece by piece, and we break it apart, you know, maybe a little bit too much, right? But it turns out that's for a structural reason, because this has to do with how the code writes code. Um, but linked lists, are, they're kind of nice for things called functional programming and so on, which we'll get to in a second. But um, we know how to put a piece, build one of these things now, right? Uh, is there a way to take it apart? So if we have, you know, one, two, three, how do we, how do we grab the first item? We could car it. Gives us one. Uh, then there's another thing called cutter. Gives us an end. Well, okay, these are obviously obvious names, right? Car and cutter. Would it would be way better if we had first and oops. Uh, and actually, that doesn't come by default. Um, I have to import something. Use modules. Surfy, surfy one, which you would never know to add, put in, right? Uh, so that that could be first, and then this could be the rest, right? One and does it not have that in Surfy One? Okay, never mind. I never should have shown you for Surfy One. Screw for Surfy One. All right. Okay. Um, what is Car and Cutter doing? Well, earlier remember we did cons A and B. So in a linked list, a linked list just has is just basically a thing with two things in it. It has the front part and the back part. Due to the historical way that Lisp has in, been implemented, and Scheme is a Lisp, um, e, all the way back in the first implementation of Lisp. Uh, the this was efficiently implemented with a cont cell being made. You to access the first part, you use the content address rec register, and to access the second part, you use a content decrement register, and that no longer applies to any Lisp implementations. But does it matter? Nope, because names get installed in the universe and they stick around. We kind of don't have a better name for this because. Um, it's kind of useful to just say, oh, we have a thing that has two things in it, right? You know, the first one and then the second one. But, you know, it gets a little bit confusing because when we, we're talking about the second one, we've got cons one and cons two and blah, blah, blah. The cutter of that very thing of one, two is actually not just the number two. It's it's uh, the list with the number two, right? I'm going to do car of the cutter. Get that out. All right. Okay. I've convinced you. Whispers spend way too much time on these cars and these cutters, and they do. But it's important. This is history, right? This is this is relevant to how we build things. Okay. Um, but you know, we're we're starting to get a sense. Remember earlier we had. Uh, you know what? I'm just gonna paste in the expression. All right. So remember this friend. Uh, you won't because I'm in the wrong window. All right. This friend. Right. I'm gonna just put a quote here, and it'd be data. Well, I told you that earlier, right? What does that mean? Could we pull the first thing off of it? Pull the car off of it. Oh, sure enough, there it is, let. Could we pull the cutter off of it? What's the cutter? Oh, it's everything else. Well, you know, so we could start to, we could, we could get really goofy about this, right? You could get the cutter of the cutter, then we could get the cutter of that. Um, and then we could get, oh, that, actually, maybe we want the car of that. Okay, now we want the car of that, right? Oh, my gosh, this is, like, giving me a headache, right? Um, but the, uh, um, anyway, the, 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 the interesting thing here is that you can kind of piece these things apart. But they're data. Uh, there's a different way to piece these apart, by the way, called pattern matching. Use modules, ice nine, match. So we have pattern matching. So watch this. Match. We're going to take a list, one, two, three, and we'll say, um, give me the first thing and then the rest of the things. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to say, you know, format false. Uh, the first was A, the rest was A, right? So first, rest. And it pulls the first thing off and the rest. Well, this is actually... It looks weird at first, but it's actually kind of easier to read in a certain sense. Well, we, um, because you can start to, we're starting to define this by the structure. It'll become more important later. Um, but anyway, uh, I probably should not have introduced that. I'm introducing way too many things. Oh, well, Christine, it's too late. You already did it. 
Um, let's get back to our cars and cutters. Um, Lisper loves to abuse these things. Let's get to animal noises. Uh, so we can do cat says meow. And a dog says woof. A sheep says bah, right? So, um, cool. That's good enough. So there's all sorts of little tools that Lispers have made. So I could do a soak. You know, um, do we have a cat in the animal noises? Sure enough, we do. And it says meow, right? Do we have a gorilla? There's no gorillas in here. You know, we could add one, but we don't have it. No aliens either. Oh, well. Okay. Um, uh, well, you know, this is all good and well, but, but here's, here's something else interesting. You know, I showed that you could quote these things like this. What about, ooh, what if we switch from this quote to this quote? Well, it doesn't look like it's any different, right? Except there's a little trick we can do. Put this little comma here. What do you think this does? That says one, two, three. Oh my gosh. If I remove that comma, of course, it'll just be one, two, plus one, two. But with that comma there, it actually builds it out. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, well, maybe we could use that. Maybe we could actually use that to do something interesting. Like maybe we wanted to describe a cat, right? And let's actually make a procedure for this. We wanted, we're, we're in charge of a cat veterinary uh, uh, institution. And we have to make a cat entry. The name and the age. And then cat. The name is name. And the age is H. Well, that's pretty cool. Cat entry Missy and the age is mm, 16, right? And it says cat name Missy age 16. Okay, but you know what? I'm just going to copy and paste this heuristic I have that the internet told me. Um, and it's this. This says, this calculates cat years. Okay, the first year is equivalent to 15, second year is 9, year after that is 4. And then we do some math, and we can say, okay, in cat years, a 16-year-old cat is 80. Okay, so let's extend our, our cat year, uh, uh, sorry, our cat entry program. This is a little bit closer to how Lispers normally write things, actually. Sometimes you, you say, okay, that was pretty good, but actually I want to refine this a little bit. So let's do this. Let's say cat years is, and then we'll run the cat years, um, actually we'll call it a cat age. So we run cat years, and then we put the age in. Now what do, you, what do you think happens if we do the earlier Missy entry? It says the cat Missy is age 16 and the, the cat age 80. That's a little bit hard to read, so I've got this pretty print thing here with comma PP. Oh, actually, that doesn't do anything. Uh, well, if it had done what I wanted, it would have looked like this, but it didn't. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, and we can put in Kelsey, our former cat, and she was 22 when she died. Wow, 104. That's an old ass cat, right? Oh well, um, old cats. So let's uh, let's. This is cool, but you know, I still feel like uh, I still feel like we haven't gotten to see the coolest parts of Lisp yet. All right. Well, do you remember our friend Goldilocks? Define Goldilocks, right? Well, what was annoying about running Goldilocks is that when we would do Goldie, you know, and we would do this, and we kept playing with it, right? We kept playing with, you know, um, 1, and then 41, and it's like Goldilocks' preferences weren't changing. Goldilocks knew what was the best that was small and the best that was big. It would be nice if Goldilocks could hold on to, like, a memory of this. Well, she can. All right. So let's do... How, how can we do this? So the, if Goldilocks has a memory of this, well, then let's call it make Goldilocks. And you know what? Watch this. Actually, I'm going to type this out to make it a little bit clear. Um, no, I'm not, because I'm going to run a little on time. Define... Goldie. So this is the same thing inside, and I'm going to just return the Goldie. You know what? I'll call it Goldilocks. Um, so 
what you see is that I defined another procedure, Goldilocks, right inside of here, right? Inside of this make Goldilocks, and I returned it. So what happens? Make Goldilocks, 10 and 20. That's Goldilocks' preferences, and it returns a procedure, Goldilocks. Well, that's interesting. It returned a procedure. It wasn't just a procedure, but now it returns a procedure. By the way, I never said this earlier, but if you've done other programming languages, you're probably used to saying something like this, return Goldilocks. You don't have to do that in Scheme. The last thing in the expression returns it automatically. It's functional programming. There's no reason to... If you're doing functional programming, there's no reason to do that type of thing. So, okay. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to this Goldilocks. Call her Goldie. And gee, how does how does our friend Goldie feel about the number three? It's too small. What about the number thirty-three? It's too big. What about the number thirteen? It's just right. So this is interesting. We defined a procedure inside of a procedure, right? That's pretty interesting. But this inner procedure, which it returned, remembered the smallest okay and biggest okay from the outer one. This is called a closure. It's lexical scoping. It's the key to object capability security, for one thing. It's also key to writing uh, really nice functional programs. And it's also just really cool. You can basically, um, th we didn't use classes like you might in other programming languages and stuff like that. Goldilocks remembered from the context of the thing that she was defined in, what her preferences were. So that's pretty neat. Okay. So um, what what else what else can we do now that we know this? Well, remember, we're doing all this stuff with cons A and B, right? And then once you had our, our you know, we'll just call it C, right? You know, our cons is A and B, right? And then we could do the car of C. We could do the cutter of C. Well, that's cute. But how do you make it cons? Can we make it out of pure abstraction? We can. Define abstract cons. We'll take some car data. We'll take some cutter data. And we'll say, okay, we'll make another procedure. We don't have to name it if we don't want to. We can just use a lambda. Lambda, by the way, means anonymous procedure. So, you know, you name it, you put the name around it, you give it a name. But if you don't, it's just the procedure and it just returns that. So, let's, uh, our Lambda is going to take an argument, which is method. And we're going to do a cond that says, well, if that method is car, quote car, then we'll return the car data. And if the method is cutter, then we'll return the cutter data. And otherwise else, error, WTF, right? You know, I don't know what that method is, right? So, okay, define, um, let's do abstract cons. So let's do abstract cons. Um, we'll do, you know, the apple and banana. AC, it's this procedure we got back from running abstract cons. Okay. AC car. Returned apple. Cutter. Returns banana. We built this thing out of thin air. Right? We built our own cons. And there's no data structure here. <gasps> Closures are data structure. So that's what it's called when one of these procedures remembers from the context it did. It encloses that data around it and it remembers right? Um, he remembers the thing. So in a certain sense, out of pure abstraction, we're actually building our data structure here. That's pretty cool. All right, all right, all right. Cute, Christian. Very cute. But I haven't even shown you how to do a for loop yet, right? Okay, so string. Let's do it. Let's do a for loop. But before we do that, what's the length of this string, right? Three characters long, right? That's seven characters long, right? Well, you know what? I'm not going to show you a for loop. You know why? So we're going to define some animals. And it's going to be cat. And a dog. And a gorilla. And a salamander. There they are. And instead, we're going to use something called map. And what happens? Oh my gosh. 
it built a new list that went over each one of the things in here. So it went, you know, this is the same thing, of course. Remember the substitution method. Same thing as if I put this right here, right? Okay, that's interesting. It's pretty neat. Can we make our own thing that could go in here? Sure enough, define symbol length. You know, sim string length symbol to string symbol. So we could do map symbol length and we could do, you know, peanut butter. It says that's six and six, right? Okay, so you can put this procedure in and it'll do it, right? Okay, Christine, kind of cute. But, um, you know, and, and actually, this was a little bit silly. Lambda, the ultimate, we don't even need this to find. We could just do lambda. Let's tear that name right out of there. This is exactly the same thing. We know that by now with the substitution method. Okay, cute, cute, Christine, right? Cute. Well, actually, maybe building up a list of the returned values might be a waste sometimes because maybe sometimes you just want to scream things at the screen and there's nothing else to return, right? So you just want to do for each. For each doesn't build up a list that it returns. It just does stuff. It's going to take a string. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to for, use format with the hashtag tree, which makes it scream, uh, you know, print things to the screen. And we're going to say... You know, I just love, and then a bunch of exclamation marks, right? And we're going to do, and then we're going to put our string here. So we can put, you know, apple, apples, bananas, and pears. I just love apples. I just love bananas. I just love pears. And let's iterate on that a little bit. String upcase. String. I just love apples, I just love bananas, I just love pears, right? So it's screaming each one of them out. Pretty cool. Okay, that's not bad. Not bad. Not bad, Christine. Uh, except it is kind of bad. This isn't how I want to write a for each, right? If I came from the world of, uh, um, you know, it, and I don't even understand how a for each works, actually. But before we get to a nicer version of for each, let's get to how, um, how a for each works. Um, no, you know what? Uh, yeah, no, let's let's do the original plan. So the the important thing to know here is that you can do um, You know what that I, I think we might run out of time for that one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that one. No, we, we're gonna do it Let's make our own for each Procedure and a list All Right, okay, so how does it work if the list is empty Then we're done Otherwise else Let's get the item by pulling it off the list and we'll run the procedure on the item and then we'll run for each again with the same procedure and then we'll pull the next thing off the list. This is perfectly sensible. I'm sure you'd figure out how to do this on first try without ever having written scheme before, right? No, if you didn't, that's totally fine, right? But does this work? our own for each and you can see it is because this one returns done <laughs> the other one didn't right um this is kind of weird right this one in some programming languages people would say don't don't just call yourself again at the end you're gonna get a stack overflow not in scheme scheme says ah well you've got nothing else to do at the end of this you're you were you were done with this particular for each at the end here so you know what we'll just get rid of that stack item because we're not going to come back here and so, yeah, you can actually use recursion for looping. And in fact, that's actually what all recursive things in Scheme are made out of. Okay, but not um, not all things are going to be able to avoid putting things on the stack. So look at this one. We, uh, um, what if we wanted to, uh, let's, let's build a tree, right? Isn't that what everybody wants to do? Build a tree. Well, we got to have it be a certain number of depth deep, right? Uh, trees in, in programming languages are upside down, right? They look more like roots than trees. But, you know, shh, don't tell any computer scientists that they're building trees foolishly. They won't like it. So, okay, equals, so if the depth is zero, then I guess we might as well return just the list zero, right? Is that we're at the bottom of our tree. But otherwise else, well, we want to know what our current depth is. 
But then we want to put two more branches on our tree. So we'll do build tree. We'll subtract one from depth. And then what should we do on the other side? We'll do it again. So we'll build the list with those three elements. So what do you think happens? I'm going to do a pretty print on this. Build tree five. Oh, this is kind of funny. Let's get a version of this that we could actually see a little bit easier. All right. It didn't pretty print it very well for me. But it's not too hard to figure out what's going on here. Right. So um, this is basically like this. Right. Um, okay. You know, same thing over here. I'm just changing the white space. Not changing the actual structural idea of the thing that's coming out. Okay. So this is building a three, which has two twos which each have two ones, which each have two zeros, right? Oh, okay. Let's look at our definition here again. Build tree. Yeah, sure enough, that's exactly what it did, right? If it's zero, then we return this thing. Otherwise else, if it wasn't zero, we do list. We put the number, like one, right? And then we'd call build tree again with that thing. And we basically did that all the way from the top here and just build all this out. Well, this one's different. So this is recursive. This one still has work left to do. It can't do that trick with till call elimination, because it still has to build a list after doing the build tree. So it can't magically get rid of this step. It can't get rid of this step, right? So it does grow stuff on the stack. But in many nice schemes like Guile, you actually, the stack is itself uh, not, it doesn't have a stack limit. Some schemes do, some lists do. Uh, Guile does not. You can recur as much as you have memory, basically. Um, but anyway, so that's recursion. Right? So the funny thing is, is that Lisp builds things out of recursion. Except, okay, recursion is where programmers get scared. They say, oh my gosh, I don't understand what's happening anymore, right? You know, yeah, well, first of all, before I continue, let me just give you a different view of what this thing is I printed up there. This is a different way to look at it, right? Okay, starts at three at the top and two twos, and each one of those have two ones, and each one of those have two zeros, right? And we do that all the way down. Okay. Recursion. People get scared. If you're scared of it, read the book The Little Schemer. By the end of it, you'll be able to do recursion all day long without even thinking about it. All right. Cute. Cute Christine. Um, but, you know, I'm feeling like uh, feeling like it's time to move on. We haven't, I haven't even shown you how to change a variable, right? What if we had a chest, a treasure chest, and it had a sword in it? Every time we look at that chest, we say, oh, there's a sword in there. But what if I want to put something in it? Well, I could use this thing called set, and it has this, ah! You know, it has, that's not how they pronounce it, but it has this exclamation mark, which makes you think, ah! Right? And that's uh, um, the, uh, and that that's basically saying, oh, we're going to mutate something. We're going to do scary side effect things. That's what functional programmers think of what I'm about to do. I'm going to put some gold in that chest. <gasps> the chest now says gold. It's no longer the same thing. The substitution method will no longer work because we've introduced time into our system. Remember? Remember earlier? We could we could do all the way. Let's see here. Substitution, right? We could do all this thing and it would substitute down, it would substitute down, and it would substitute down. That's because times 22 and 21 is always going to be 42, right? Well, that's no longer the case, right? And if you don't believe me, let me show you, right? Let me do define make countdown n. And we're going to use our closure friend. We're going to say define the last n is n. We have to capture it because we're about to change it. If we're at 0, n, and we return 0. Otherwise, else, ooh, we have to introduce this thing we never had to see before called begin. Because... Here's the thing about implicit return. It's awesome in a functional programming language because you're just basically always substituting things, right? Not anymore. We're about to do something one after another. It's no longer de it's no longer uh, deterministic. It's declarative. Do this, then that. All right. So the next thing you're going to do in order is we're going to set n to be minus n and 1. All right. We're going to count down for gotcha's sake. And then we're going to return the last n. So we don't want this n. We want the last one. All right, so let's try it. Define countdown. I'm just going to call it CT, CTM, right? Um, is being 10, right? So I'm going to do CTN. Just call it. Uh, wait, what did I do wrong? Kind of debug in real time. You haven't even seen me hit an error before. By the way, this is what happens when things go wrong. You get this 
get this weird thing, and you're like, what the heck is this? You can do colon back T for a not very useful trace back. In this case, you do comma Q to get the heck out of there. All right, let's look at what I did wrong. Christian, what did you do? What did you do, Christian? All right, um, I did something wrong. Minus N1. Does anybody see uh, a, uh, a bug? Uh, let's see, wrong type to apply N. I'm not seeing it. Where I have confused myself. Tried to call a number, I think. Yes, but where did I try to call a number? So I'm actually not seeing it. Ah, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm cheating. I'm cheating, I'm copying and pasting in the version that I wrote before this, just to make it work again. All right. Oh, that's what, I didn't actually call make down, countdown. That's why. Yes, okay, yes, you, you got it right. You got it right. I just said, I just defined it to that. Okay, yeah, everybody in the chat found it, uh, or Rose found it, actually. Ro Rose, nice job. Okay, so this is what I needed to do, right? Define CDN. Um, okay, we'll do that. Um, and we can just call that over again. And it goes smaller and 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 smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller until it hits zero and then it just stays at zero, right? That's what our make the countdown does. Okay. Cute. Cute. Um, but uh, we've now broken the world of determinism. Countdown is no longer the same timing every time you count it, uh, you call it. So um, we've introduced time, and time is powerful. Yes, uh, Bruce is, uh, um, is citing SICP. That's exactly where I got these ideas from, a whole bunch of them, right? Um, and... Uh, um, but the thing about time is um, it does make the world not deterministic, but sometimes change is useful, right? Uh, functional programmers try to capture change in different ways, but you can do it like this. Uh, now, if you read the tutorial, I show that there are other ways of changing things. There are like vectors that can change and so on, but we don't have that much time left, so I'm going to just show you something else. Uh, let's get to uh, let's get to the idea of you know how can we make things easier to write. So I'm actually I'm just going to jump to um, you know, what if what if we wanted to do something that was actually going to do be imperative and is going to do two things in a row? You know, do thing one and do thing two. And we really, you know, we don't care what the alternate case is in this if. Um, in some schemes, you can even just eliminate it. But this is actually kind of annoying to write. What we prefer to write is this. When our test, just get rid of this begin. We just know already we want to do those two things. Oh, that'd be way nicer. How can we do this? Right? Um, well, you know, we did learn that there's this code that can write code. So can we try doing that? Let's try writing when with the test. And then we, we learned we can capture all the other arguments with this dot. So we'll do test and then the body. Okay. If test, then otherwise else, we'll const the begin onto body. Yes, there's another way to do that. All of you out there who know about quasi quote, but we'll we'll ignore that. So when our test, otherwise else, do thing one, do thing two. Well, that built the right thing, right? So this it put the begin in there, and everything, right? You know, it, this is exactly what we wanted, except it didn't actually it doesn't run it, right? And we had to quote everything. So this isn't good. This isn't how you do one. Uh, but you're, you're, it's kind of good because it actually did build up the right structure. Well, is there a way? And I know schemers in the audience are about to scream at what I'm doing. Common lispers will we'll celebrate. Define macro. Okay, let's try it. When string... Uh, Chorus, um, display, oh yeah, chorus is cool, wait, no, it's a string, right, yeah, something like that, we'll do two things in a row, yeah, it's a string, right, you know, 42, doesn't do anything, right, so, okay, so, our when worked, we defined a when and it worked, so this define macro thing basically turns that procedure that writes this expression into 
something we that actually our compiler or, or our, our Lisp environment is smart and says, oh, actually, I'm going to expand this out. And, and actually, watch this. Expand this whole thing. And it says, oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to turn it into. This thing right here. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, yes, Guile does have SI, um, common Lisp style macros. And Guilers don't like them. And the reason for that is something called hygiene. So I'm not going to get into hygiene, except for to just show you with the hygienic version. This is what, instead of doing this, Lispers like Guile users, or schemers like Guile users would do this. Define syntax rule when test and then we do body and then dot 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 remember i showed that pattern matcher earlier if test begin body dot 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 and actually it's kind of neat because we actually don't have to put these quotes in or the unquotes at all it just figures it out based off of the pattern it's a little bit easier to read but it's a it's harder to understand how it works when you're understanding what macros are the first time but it works the same right works just as well Oh yeah, that's a string. All right, so um, so we defined our own when. Well, kind of cute. When is a little bit cute, but let's let's consider that earlier thing that I did with for each, right? This, you know, what I'd much rather do, what I'd much rather do, is something like this for the string apples, bananas, and pears. It should be like this. Oh. This is a thing I can much eat. Oh my gosh. Now it looks like a loop, right? Okay. Huh. Can we make something that works that way? Yeah, sure. This should be pretty easy. Let's just uh let's just think. We have to build something that looks like that. Okay. Let's try it. So we'll do you know what? We're actually just we can actually just kind of take it and kind of uh patternify it. So we're gonna say, um, we're going to say, let's take this above thing, which we know is a pattern. And we're going to say, define syntax rule. Well, we know we want it to be four. Then we want the next thing to be the ID. And then we want the next thing to be the list that we're going to iterate over. And then the inside part is going to be the body, right? Well, what that turned it into was this. So I'm just going to copy paste that in and put in the things that we were going to replace it with. So this part is more generically the ID, right? So this thing right here. This part is more generically the list. And this part is more generically the body, right? Let's see if this works. Four. Actually, you know what? I already did it earlier. I'm unquote this. Does it work? It does! It worked! No, my gosh, this is this just worked right off the bat, right? So uh, we can make a better version of for loops. So this is really cool. So like there's all sorts of things. So uh, just to give an idea of how cool this is, in, um, in uh, you, you can use this to make pattern matching. So you're, if your programming language doesn't come with pattern matching, earlier I showed off the, the pattern matcher, you can actually make a pattern matcher um, by using macros like this. If your programming language doesn't come with coroutines, you can use various things that Lisp gives you to build coroutines in. If your programming language doesn't, and in fact, actually with Python, with the Python, there was a Lisp on top of Python called Hi I used to be involved in. And in Python 3, one of the big things that was going to come out was there was going to be these, these this coroutine support with uh, what was called yield from, and it's now called await. And uh, Paul Tegliamonti, who ran the Hi project, pr showed that actually we could backport all that code to Python 2 with our own version of yield from that we just wrote as a macro. And it worked the same for the high version that ran on top of the Python 2 as it did for Python 3. So the, in other programming languages, you have to beg for the, pro, the please give us this convenience to your programmers, you know, of the programming language. If only you could extend the language for us. You don't have to do that. In Lisp, you can just build that stuff for you. Lisp gives you the power to become a god. And in fact, don't believe me, just how, look at how much of a god we're going to become. Now, we have run to the end of our time. So I am just going to show you by copying and pasting in some code and just telling you what each piece is. All right. The first thing is we're going to pull in that hatter matcher, right? And the second thing is we're going to build these things called environments, right? So what we're building here, um, actually, let me just show it to you. 
That'd be even better, right? Um, so let's see here. Does this work? There we go. All right, look at this. There's 30 lines of code. That's it, right? 30 lines of code here. This is scheme written in scheme. 30 lines of code, 30 freaking lines. I mean, if you remove the white space and comments. Does it work? Can you write a scheme interpreter inside a scheme in 30 lines of code and have it actually work? Well, let's find out. Let's uh, let's actually just, I'm just gonna evaluate this whole reason, region. Um, pressing control C, control B in, in Emacs will actually evaluate this whole thing. And I'm gonna jump right back to, whoops, uh, the REPL. And let's actually give it a try. So let's do evaluate. Um, plus one, two, right? And we'll give it, um, we're going to do quasi quote. We're going to give it the the default environment of plus, right? So sure enough, that works with three. I'm going to do lambda x and do times x and two. And then we're going to pass in 20. Uh, you know what? We're going to pass in 21, right? Give it a plus. Oops. Give it the wrong thing. Not plus. This one needs times. Because we're actually supplying the default argument here as a second thing. And it can do 42. Oh my gosh. This Lisp interpreter works. We just produced a doubler here. And then we ran it. Okay. Cute, Christine. Cute. All right. You want to see how just how cool this thing is? Just, just you watch. Just you watch. All right. I'm going to paste in some cool ass shit. All right. I'm not going to type it out live. I'm just going to see it. This is a program to calculate the Fibonacci sequence. This is a Fibonacci program, uh, main program right here. You know, if it's n is equal to 0, we return 0. Otherwise, if it's equal to 1, then we call the Fibonacci sequence with itself again because we don't have names in this version of the emulator we, or, or the... Uh, interpreter we wrote and uh we call it with itself and also we subtract this one with one and we subtract this one with two um okay so we actually pass the procedure of fibonacci to itself through this boot thing which takes the procedure and an argument and calls the procedure with that argument so therefore fibonacci will get access to itself and then the argument we're passing in is 10 okay cute cute christian this isn't gonna work right I mean, what do you need for Fibonacci to work? I mean, it needs bare minimum, right? It's going to need that plus thing that's right there. And it's going to need the equal thing right here. This is too cute, Christine. This isn't going to work. Fib program. Fib environment. Is it going to work? <gasps> it calculated the Fibonacci sequence. Oh my god, it works! We wrote an interpreter in Scheme in 30 lines of code. I mean, well, I copied and pasted in a interpreter of Lean. But if you read the Scheme, uh, the, the A Scheme Primer, which is associated with this talk, it walks you through how the whole thing works. And surprisingly, that whole Scheme Interpreter, this whole thing, um, it's actually... Oh, wait. It's not in here. It's in the other one. Uh, um, whoop. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to understand, shockingly. Um, where is it? Wait. Um, so I just scroll madly up and down. Um, there it is. So this, this thing is not too hard to understand. It just basically, it's, you support built-in types, you support quoting, you support variable lookup, you add conditionals, you add lambdas, you add procedure invocation. If you like this idea of learning this type of thing, Read the, um, uh, um, so, so Rose asks something interesting. Can you run something you want, don't 100% trust inside your interpreter and be confident it can't escape the environment? Yes, you can. That's correct. Why? This interpreter only gets access to the things that we give it, right? It has to take an initial environment, right? So, and it only has access to conditionals and lambdas and stuff like that. The worst thing it can do is get into an infinite loop. And heck, you could add like a gas counter to it and you could even prevent it from doing that, right? Um, so yes, there is nothing that this fib program, we could have done something like this. I'm gonna write something really scary inside my fib program, right? This would kill my operating system. System, haha, watch, watch this. System. 
Uh, system star. RM. Dash RF. Home C Weber. Gosh, I hope I'm right. Right? If I'm wrong, I'm in big trouble. Oh, variable unfound. System star. It's not there. Okay. It's safe. I'm glad that I was right and I learned how to write the sandbox correctly. Otherwise else, I would be crying. Um, so yes, uh, you, uh, you're exactly right, Rose. You can use that to make an environment safe. Um, and that's the end of this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I really recommend reading the a scheme primer thing that um, we've shipped here. Um, it's under CC BY. It basically, in just a very, it's exactly the same thing that we did, except just with, a, a, you know, a bunch more footnotes and uh, a few extra little pieces. And uh, in really just in 30 pages of, of, of um, that text, you'll be able to learn how to write your own scheme and scheme. And yes, you really can play around with this. And in just a few modifications, you can even change it so that it will be a logic programming language and do like stuff like uh, um, Prolog. And if you study structure and interpretation of computer programs, they have exactly something like this, and they do that exactly in there. Uh, and it should be much easier to learn, read structure and interpretation of computer programs having gone through this tutorial. So actually, I think I'm going to stop the recording, and let's just uh, chat about things. So that's it for this tutorial. Um, and let's just have a conversation as a group, which can be about all sorts of things, including this.